Welcome to Buffalo Game Day Recap. I'm Thad Brown along with A.J. Feldman. The Bills get it done. Fifth win in a row. Knock off the Dolphins 21-14. Clinch a fourth straight division title. They will be home in the playoffs for two weeks. It's an incredible turnaround. And, of course, A.J., the only thing anyone wanted to talk to me about after the game was me and Dan Faith from uh, Wham TV chasing after Josh Allen after the game. Now, to be honest, I have seen some of the uh, the 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 viral pieces that are out there. I've seen the video at this point. Obviously, I lived the video, so I was there. <laughs> but but kind of give me an idea as someone who legitimately does not know how this became a thing when all these other things were probably more important things on Sunday night. Well, so the the NFL literally the NFL Twitter account tweets out the video of you know, what they thought was Josh Allen running and celebrating, you know, with Bills fans, et cetera, things of that nature. And then I think, you know, everybody in the the Western New York media sphere saw that and obviously saw, you know, you chasing after him, Dan, right on your tail with, uh, you know, his, his interesting running style as he's holding that camera. I didn't even see it through that. I didn't realize that it had gone um, that uh, you know, viral through the NFL account. People are kind of retweeting that. I found it on myself. So I, I was out in our studio on air at about 1130, 1135. I come back to the, to the editing room in our, uh, you know, our sports office. And I start piecing together like the final couple of plays that I'll need because we, we air our highlights for, for sunrise sports. And I just see this and I just start cracking up laughing. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen. It's still could be the funniest thing I've ever seen. I, of course, included that in the Sunrise Sports and did my own commentary in it. So congratulations to the morning crew. You've got that. So everybody, you know, I tweeted it out there. You know, Dan retweeted it. You know, everybody in the sports media sphere is retweeting it. I think the general reaction, of course, is you're getting very little attention, A, because Dan is, you know, it looks like he's in such a big hurry. And then, of course, his uh, his Moe's Schrute, Forrest Gump running style. I think you just fade into the background of this race, which I think for, you know, all things considered is kind of what you were, uh, you know, you're happy with here. Oh, hundred percent. I am totally fine to be the other guy in this. Um, someone on Twitter said that they thought that we were going to bite it. And to be honest, like both Dan and I have done the job long enough that you know how to run with a camera on your shoulder and not go down because the risk of destruction of camera is so great that you can't ever have that happen. But when it was brought up, it occurred to me that if that was the one time ever that I went face first with camera gear, viewfinder, battery bouncing in 16 different directions, I would have never lived it down. So I'm glad that that was not, I did not understand how televised that was. Now, I will admit two things. Number one, when I was running after Josh Allen, knowing the game was the Sunday night game, there was a distinct possibility that it could be on TV. I didn't realize <laughs> to the extent to which, which it was on TV. And then as for the race, I didn't realize Dan was there. I thought I had that all to myself. And when he popped up my left, that dude can close, man. I was, a little, I was a little upset. I thought I had that shot, and he passed me, made me look bad. Now, look, Dan's got one or two or, like, 15 years on me. So I think the appropriate person won. And as someone else pointed out, no hamstrings were pulled, so that's a victory. But I, I'm not going to lie. I was a little put out that I finished number two in that race, even though I, I was a heavy underdog to even come close. So I, I'm fine with how it turned out, but – but yeah, I still still gonna be a little mad I didn't win. It couldn't have been better because if you know the, the race was in the beginning of the shot and, and and that camera shot itself really doesn't get anything of Josh Allen. It gets like it basically just gets you guys. So shout out to NBC for a little being a little short or you know, slow on the trigger there to to go to a different shot to to start with the sky cam. You know, I'm sure. Um, I can't wait to see Dan. I'm, I'm sure there'll be some sort of a clip perhaps posted of you're the Miami Dolphins. Josh is the AFC East and Dan is the Bills passing them. I'm just going to put that out there right now. So when Dan eventually makes that tweet, I can I can share this part right here where I where I clearly predicted what he was putting out for social media. Somebody can make that if they want. By the way, you know what, what I conclude? Once again, Dan Fates and I are better at our job than national photographers <laughs> are at theirs. That's what the only thing I'm taking from you. All right, let, let's talk about the, you know, the game and stuff. Um, look, Bills get a win 21-14. It was not pretty. And really, you know, and, and, and you said it, and, and I'm going to talk about this in, in uh, my column that'll be up on rosterfirst.com in the morning. This game was a good epitome of what this season was. It did not look ugly. It was not the way anyone expected. But you ended up right where the Bills, right where we thought the Bills would be. They won a fourth straight division title. 
They're a two seed. They're going to be home for at least two rounds of playoffs. And the thing that sticks to me in this game, this, this might be a little less the microcosm part, but I was very impressed with the number of other guys, of unsung heroes who were the heroes in this game. Guys that, you know, to some degree have been dismissed as quality players. You know, Deontay Hardy has been a miss, you know, certainly as a wide receiver and generally as a punt returner. His last big play on a punt return was a fumble, but he made the play that sparked the Bills. I mean, I, I will tell you, I don't think the Bills win this game if he doesn't run that punt back for a touchdown because Miami was in full control. But on top of that, you had, you know, Balin Spector coming in and making plays as your, your fifth linebacker, basically, from when the season started. Taylor Rapp, who has been, you know, very nondescript as a safety, has the game-clinching interception. And not only was it great to have those guys make plays so you win this game, but one thing Carl Jones and I have talked a lot about this year is that the Bills haven't had the dogs to win games. And then lately, since they were 6-6, six and six, you've seen guys step up. Ed Oliver had a play. Greg Rousseau a couple weeks ago. Obviously, Josh Allen's made plays. Well, now you've got, you know, you got dogs falling out of your ears. I mean, you got players left and right who have been contributing and making major uh, plays that finish off wins. You have to question Brandon Bean's communication because it's very clear that when he signed Taylor Rapp, when he signed Deontay Hardy, when he signed Trent Sherfield, he told them, all right, we're bringing you in to win games. We need to win games in January. And that's all they heard. And they just, they <laughs> only, the they only participated in January. So all three of those signings, this game itself, you know, at least the 21 to 14 win. And no, it, it wasn't pretty. It was ugly. I'm sure there are some Bills fans who turned it off at halftime. You know, they made the playoffs. All right, let's get to sleep. Let's make sure we, we, you know, don't snooze on our alarm clock too many times in the morning. It really was the epitome of the season. You had Josh Allen doing great Josh Allen things. You had Josh Allen, bad interceptions. You had Gabe Davis, Josh Allen, miscommunications, a microcosm of this season. Eventually, you know, he gets it done. Uh, it, it's, you know, the, the Bills won five straight. They were six and six. They're 11 and six. They win the division. And through this all, somehow, some way, the Bills are the two seed. They're the two seed in this thing. None of those losses really came back to bite him in the butt. They really, you know, they would have needed probably two or three more to catch the Ravens. So it didn't even do that. They lost a game to the Patriots, which knocked them down from second in the draft to the top two quarterbacks down to third. So a good loss there for the Buffalo Bills for the next 15 years. And no, they find a way to get it done. And I think really the, the most important thing in this is, is the fact that they get those two games, of course, if they are to beat the Steelers, because it's one thing to get into the dance and the AFC is a crapshoot and trying to win three games on the road like the Dolphins are basically going to have to do now. It's another thing to get two games at home. They're heavy favorites against the Steelers. Odds are they're going to be favorites against whoever they get in the second round if that's Kansas City. And then who knows what happens in an AFC championship game if you get there. So this is just a really big win for their long, long-term future in terms of this playoff run. Yeah. And something I've talked about, it seems like at least in the regular season, everything always seems to work out for the bills. And this is another year of that, but obviously they did a giant share of that, you know, winning those games um, on their own. And I think coaching deserves an incredible piece of the credit. I mean, you think about it and we're going to talk about this for a second, but, Tyler Dunn writes that article during the bye week about all these things that essentially it's a it's a uh, prosecutor's argument for why Sean McDermott should not be the coach. And all Sean McDermott has done since is win five games, three on the road, three against teams that were leading their division at the time. He's got a defense that's playing really well, despite literally no one you know left from the group that he wanted to have on the field. Maybe a couple guys up front. I'm exaggerating a bit for the effect though of, of how good a job he's done. And then in this game. You know, two things that I want to point out specifically, number one, um, and, and I'll, I'll let you respond to this, but the thing that really turned this game along with the Hardy punt return touchdown was that the Bills absolutely out-adjusted the Dolphins when it came to, you know, halftime was the line of demarcation, but I'm sure the adjustments were happening sooner. Miami came out running the ball at will. Buffalo took that away the few times. Miami only ran it three times in the second half. Coaching malpractice, from my point of view, by Mike McDaniel. But regardless... The Bills stopped that. The Bills stopped Tyreek Hill, who was dominating the first half. That is an incredible piece of coaching to say, yeah, you're killing us with this. Let's Here's how we're going to fix it. And then not just to execute it and, and stop the bleeding, but to totally flip that around and say, we're going to smother you with these things that you've been succeeding on in the first half. 
Yeah, I mean, Miami was doing the keep it simple, stupid. What they were doing, running the ball, doing their little pitch plays out to HN, getting outside, using his speed. It was working. So they kept doing it. They kept doing it. They got the touchdown. You know, HN made Jordan Poyer look pretty foolish on mm-hmm. that play. And it, it was working. They were, I think, at 7.7-ish yards per carry in the first half, something along those lines. That's stupid. And then second half t- comes around and they they couldn't do anything. I mean, this is this is Miami's drive log in the second half. It's three and out, it's four and out with a punt. It's three and out, it's three and out, and then it's four plays in the pick to end the game. Against the number one scoring offense or you know, yards per game offense in the NFL. Obviously, they're you know, they're missing Raheem Mostert, mm-hmm. they're missing Jalen Wilder, they're a little short-handed. But what an effort by the Bills defense, especially, you know, you lose Russell Douglas, who was the, you know, the turning point of, of this defense. Everybody's praised the way he's changed things. They lose Tyrell Dodson, where, you know, coming in from Matt Milano, he's been a really solid piece. Now you have Balen Specter, who nobody, you know, you know, Balen Specter is maybe the last guy you want against this Miami Dolphins defense. He's not the quickest guy in the world. He's he's like a slow trotting traditional linebacker just stuff up there and get tackles and somehow they're able to get it done good story from Russell Douglas by the way after the game he said that uh even with the knee injury he was going to try and come back in he talks to Dane Jackson on the sideline Dane's like he said Dane looked him in the eye and said Rasul if you're not 100 percent I promise you I got you and and Dane played well he had a you know a good big pass breakup in that fourth quarter as well so they they had guys you know stepping in on defense and you know again credit to McDermott and his staff for having all of these guys ready to go. It's not just the starting 11 or the, or the main 13 or 14 who play. You know, you had, you know, the, the 18th, 19th, 20th players on defense who had to make plays in this game, and, and they succeeded. And then even some game strategy stuff. You know, on the last drive where the Bills had the ball, I love the idea to go for it on fourth and one um, from inside the, the 35. I remember exactly where it was in the field. But – you have a quarterback in Josh Allen who's been nearly unstoppable on quarterback sneaks. I know that they stopped him a couple times late, whatever. <laughs> Including even, the game winning one. <laughs> but well, exactly. Yeah. Even, even in that spot though, if you give up, if you give the ball up there, there's four and a half minutes to go. I think the likely scenario is that Miami drives down, even if they score, all you are is tied. Yeah, they could have gone for two. I don't think they would have, but you would have had plenty of time to answer that, even if things went absolutely bad. So I thought it was smart risk management because there wasn't a ton. And then obviously, you know, you've got this hammer of a quarterback that should be successful anyway. So I love that. And then the, the second one I, I thought was a no brainer. I mean, I don't even know if you give the coach credit for that, but Hey, you know, at least he didn't do the wrong thing there. So good uh, game management at the end by McDermott. Yeah. I mean, fourth and one at their own 35, it, it's certainly not, you know, it's not even a midfield. It's in their territory. It's the type of play that McDermott has punted on in the past. You know, he's, you know, you just talk about field positioning. I'm sure post game, he would have, you know, talked about, you know, the punts, the, the defense was rolling. He was feeling good, things of that nature, but no, you know, they, they, they he trusted his guys to, to get one yard, it was successful and it and burned off, you know, more timeouts for Miami, th- all three of them, two and change. And, you know, you could say that, uh, you know, helped Miami force the ball down the field on that final drive and led to the, the interception by Mr. Taylor Rapp. Let's talk about some of the negative from this game because, um, you know, as you pointed out, Miami was pretty beat up. They got further beat up in this game, losing, you know, Andrew Van Ginkle. And I think their fourth string edge rusher, they, they were down to, you know, yanking people out of the stands to rush the passer on the edge by the end of this game. And Melvin Ingram, who may not be any much different than that right now. Um, and the Bills still let Miami not only hang around, but like look like the better team, frankly, for for three quarters or so. And, you know, it starts with 17. And I know I'm actually interested to see more on what the first interception was, because I wasn't sure if that's necessarily a Josh Allen throw. But again, you know, even if it was Gabe Davis's fault for not being in the right spot, Josh doesn't have to make that throw. You could just take the sack. You could throw the ball in the fourth row and you make sure you get your three. So that's still a bad quarterback play. You know, the second interception is a fourth down play. Frankly, you know, getting an interception was good for the Bills and I get that, no problem. But the end of the half play is utterly inexcusable. I mean, there's there's no defending that. You cannot be a quarterback at this level and make that play. That essentially was a turnover. And then the fumble, you know, Josh has been better with fumbles this year, but that was, you know, another bad one where you're in a spot, you have an opportunity to, I think it was take the lead. Let me check this. I think it's take the lead right there. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I th- they would have gotten close. Oh, they were I, still I down. All right, this was before yeah, the, the, four, the, the fumble, 14 the seven. Game. Yeah. Regardless, regardless, it's it's you know early fourth quarter or late third quarter actually. It's reasonable to take a three there. There's no reason to continue trying to you know chase that. And and look, we know who Josh Allen is. He's the guy that's always going to try and make the hero play. But it bit him in this game, you know. And and he made you know multiple incorrect plays to where and God, I've said this about a hundred times. If he does this in the playoffs, they're going to lose, and that's really the story of this again with Josh Allen. And and the and the Bills dominated, you know, yards wise, yes. you know, things of that nature. It was basically the game last year in Miami, the Heat game, in terms of yardage. Last year, you know, they lost twenty one nineteen. It was four ninety seven to two twelve yards for the Bills. This time around, four seventy three to two seventy five, a a two hundred yard advantage, and they ended up needing. You know, a punt return touchdown from 96 yards, the longest in franchise history. So they almost did it again. And, you know, it, it's the same old Bills. It's the same old Josh Allen. And now you got to, you know, see if he can keep the good and leave most of the bad out because it's just still, you know, showing up and in, in a playoff situation. The thing is with they've them having to win all these many games, they've, they've quote unquote, gotten lucky so many times down in a row can this five game winning streak extend into nine, which is what it's going to have to do. That's, that's a lot asking if you're playing within these margins all the way down the stretch. Yeah. They blew out Dallas, but the other four wins were all close. You know, two of them for sure were against teams that you don't want the bills being close with this one. I think you can argue for it, but you, you don't have to. And that's definitely a concern. And, and, you know, you talk about good luck. I know the, the general luck opinion on the bills that's been decidedly really bad, but lately They've recovered a large percentage of their fumbles. The last, what, three balls that have been deflected straight in the air have been landed in Bill's arms. I mean, the, the seven points they had at halftime was one of the luckier plays you're going to see with Trent Shirley. Yeah. Heck of a catch, but the ball ending up in a spot where he could make that catch was ridiculously lucky. So, yeah, things have been, you know, bouncing their way. And then, look, that's probably what's going to happen for a five-game win streak. But your point is excellent. If this is going to be a nine-game win streak, how much luck do they have to have when everybody they're playing – has been a close game. And Josh Allen has been a big part of why that's been. I mean, you go back to the opener. That's what I was thinking of fourth quarter when it's 14 to seven. I'm like, I'm watching the Jets game all over again. And and this time it was the Bills that got the punt return. So it worked yeah. out in their favor. <laughs> all right. Um, and then one other thing that I, I want to hit on, at least uh, from the negative point of view, and I talked about this on Twitter last week, and I don't think we really brought it up in game day recap, but, you know, James Cook yep. and his hands are, are a big question mark. And, and it's not... I think I looked it up. He's got five drops this year, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when he doesn't get wide receiver targets, the percentage is pretty high. And, and especially another... when they're the five biggest drops like he could possibly oh, ever have. Yeah, I mean, he, he does have them in really bad spots. But, yeah, the, the one he dropped and that throw that Josh Allen made to the end zone was probably Josh's best throw of the game. I thought it was a ridiculously good throw. But, you know, Cook is uh, at least a dependable, necessary weapon in the pass game. He doesn't have to be – the first, second, or third best receiver, but you need him involved. And if he's going to blow these plays over and over, like he has all season long, then this is again, the type of thing that's going to bite you in the playoffs. Yeah. And with Leonard Fournette being elevated instead of Latavius Murray, you have to wonder when push comes to shove, it's, it's one thing if you're, you know, driving down the field, maybe you keep Cook in there, you know, keep the semblance of the run game, you know, keep him in those low pressure situations. But if you get to third downs, if you get to the red zones, when you need a catch, that's the one thing Leonard Fournette can do. You know, his pass coverage or pass blocking is a little shaky, as as you pointed out, but he can catch the ball. He makes a lot of catches. And generally, if it hits him in the hands, he's going to make that catch. So do they differ away from that when, when push comes to shove, especially James Cook, a second year guy who, you know, hasn't really done much of anything in the playoffs, Leonard Fournette. They call him playoff Lenny for a reason. I think it's a valid question. I think the Bills have big problems if they're doing that because yeah. Cook is, you know, obviously the better athlete at this point in, in both careers. And, uh, you know, Fournette has shown show me anything to think he's got some, you know, reservoir juice that the Bills need to tap into. He's probably better than Murray right now. I, I totally understood the reason for elevating him this week. Murray's been, you know, kind of sagging in his level of play. But Cook is the guy. Cook is the guy you want to have on the field. And, and if you don't feel like you can have him on the field because of his hands, then that's a bigger problem. And I don't think they're going to go to that. I think Cook will continue to get the opportunities. He just better bleep and catch catch them next time. And speaking of next time, there's going to be a few more next times. You know, I think uh, we all feel like, I mean, the the line on the Steelers game is nine and a half. 
Um, so I think there's an excellent chance the Bills certainly play at least two home games. I, I, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I am dying to see Bills Chiefs in Orchard Park just to see what happens. I know Bills fans everywhere you know, expect Pat Mahomes to melt into a pile of goo the moment he shows up in Orchard Park because he's not at home for the first time ever. We know that won't happen, but it doesn't mean that the Chiefs are going to win. It'll be a fascinating game. Obviously, the Bills have to get through Pittsburgh first, but Baltimore is not a team that anyone trusts in the playoffs. I don't care what seed they are, and Lamar Jackson's a big reason why. Doesn't mean he doesn't know if the MVP is going to win. And actually, let me give an aside there. I assume Josh Allen's turnovers killed any chance he's the MVP. Is that the general take? I, I don't think there's any arguments uh, okay. going forward. Good. We'll move past that then. Baltimore is not a team that I'm going to say for sure will get past the winner of Cleveland and Houston, You know, which is who they likely will play. And it's not out of the realm that the AFC Championship game, if the Bills can handle their business week one here in the playoffs and then beat Kansas City, I don't think they handle your business game, but certainly a game they can win. You know, you could see Buffalo hosting Joe Flacco for a right to go to the Super Bowl. You know, Bills Cleveland in the AFC Championship game might be the signal that the world's going to end, but it might happen. So the point is, is that the Bills, all the season long, even these last three weeks, being this kind of facepalm level team that will drive you nuts, but have found a way to be the number two seed. I also think this team is really, really dangerous in the playoffs. They have figured out ways to make it work without a bunch of injured players on defense. Josh Allen, yeah, he's going to turn the ball over, you know, a, a mind numbing amount of times, but he also knows how to make plays and he's a weapon in the run game. They've figured out how to involve, I think, better to a degree, the Dalton Kincaids, the, even the Trent Shurfields, those guys, they are figuring things out. They're succeeding and they're making it work. And in an AFC where no one looks good outside of Baltimore, and like I said, no one trusts Baltimore, you know, the Bills are going to feel, forget about just being the two seed, they've got to feel really optimistic and reasonably so about their chances to make it to Las Vegas. Yeah, I mean, of all the teams in the AFC they get, of course, when you're the two seed, this typically happens. They get the Pittsburgh Steelers, who are not a good football team. They've got Mason Rudolph leading them as quarterback. Their, their best player in general, TJ Watt, Odds are he's not going to play this game. You know, it, it seems like that injury suffered against the Ravens isn't a, a long-term season-ending injury, but a couple weeks is, is what we're hearing on that. So, you know, all, all the great things we said about Sean McDermott in the past, if they if they find a way to blow this thing to Mason mm-hmm. Rudolph and the Pittsburgh Steelers, those all go. But no, the red carpet is is somehow rolled out for this team to go on a little run here. You know, you beat the Steelers, you build some momentum. You you probably get the Chiefs in Kansas City, or you get that Houston Cleveland game if if the if the Dolphins can pull out an upset, and it suddenly rolled right out there for them. So somehow, some way, for this team that lost to Mac Jones and had twelve men on the field against Russell Wilson and lost to Zach Wilson, all of these things, suddenly it goes from the reason why the Bills are never going to win anything, they're not going to make the playoffs. Sean McDermott's the worst. It can become, you know, the galvanizing story when they make the DVD or anything like that. It, it'd make a, a great story if they do it, but, you know, they, they got to take care of business here. And they might have to send Mike Vrabel a fruit basket or something, maybe some <laughs> Tim Hortons, because the only reason the Bills are the division champs, now there's lots of reasons, but the, the one of the main ones is that Tennessee somehow rallied from 14 down against Miami in Miami with like four minutes to go. And then Tennessee gets the Bills into the playoffs today by knocking off Jacksonville. And, and I'll tell you what, there was a, a part of me that thought for three and a half quarters that maybe the Bills had relaxed and exhaled too much that they were in the playoffs. It didn't feel like that they had the same amount of desperation, you know, going into this game. I'm certainly, you know, we're, it looked like they were playing for three quarters like a team that didn't need to win the game, you know. So, um, but Tennessee helped them out, and and you know they were able to finish the job here, and and you know, I'm impressed. Um, kind of, you know, a little LOL in the background of that, but hey, the, the Bills did the job they had to do, and and here we are you know, a a reasonable chance to make it to the Super Bowl. Somehow, some way, you know, it's very much looking into the future. They, like I said, they could fall flat on their faces against the Steelers, but I mean, if you look at Josh Allen showed you, you, you saw the game plan for Buffalo blowing the game to Pittsburgh. Josh Allen throws two ridiculous interceptions. Well, one ridiculous one has a fumble, has a boneheaded play to cost you points at the end of the half. Yeah. A team like Pittsburgh could pick you off because a team like the Chargers with Easton Bleep and Stick nearly picked you off. So yeah, it, it could definitely happen at any point. We don't. I'm not going to pick it. No one's going to predict it. But you know, th- this is the danger of, of who the Bills are, and and the reason they're dangerous is because of, in large part, what's happening around them. You know, if, if this is an AFC with Joe Burrow, and if the 
Chiefs had figured out that the receiving core they put together was going to be terrible, and it was last year's Chiefs, then yeah, this is a whole different discussion we're having about the Bills. But in this current AFC, the Bills are a danger team. Wide open. Wide open. All right. Once again, uh, you can watch Buffalo Game Day Recap every single week at RochesterFirst.com on YouTube. You can also listen to it wherever you get your podcast. Next week, it'll be me and Carl Jones from Highmark Stadium, Bills and the Steelers. We will break that one down for you. One o'clock Sunday game. The gods have smiled upon us for the schedule at least once in this postseason. Can't wait for that. For AJ Feldman, I'm Thad Brown. Thanks for watching Buffalo Game Day Recap. We will see you next week in the playoffs.